The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People was written by Stephen Covey and it's the first book about success I ever picked up. It was written about 30 years ago, but it's still a book held in extremely high regard by businessmen, influencers, and me as well. Covey believes that the way we see the world is entirely based on our own perceptions. In order to change a given situation, we must change ourselves, and in order to change ourselves, we must be able to change our perceptions. This is a re-upload of my last seven videos combined into one single video on the request of some people in the comment section. If you've already seen all of these videos separately, maybe this is a nice recap video video for you that will help you remember the habits better. Alright, let's get started. The first habit that Covey discusses is being proactive. What distinguishes us as humans from all other animals is our inherent ability to examine our own character, to decide how to view ourselves and our situations and to control our own effectiveness. To put simply, in order to be effective, one must be proactive. Reactive people take a passive stance and they believe the world is happening to them. They say things like, there's nothing I can do or that's just the way I am wired. And they think the problem is out there, outside of themselves, but that thought is the problem. Reactivity becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You are giving up control. And reactive people feel increasingly victimized and out of control because of it. Proactive people, however, recognize that they have the responsibility, which Covey defines as the ability to choose how you will respond to any given stimulus or situation. In order to be proactive, we must focus on the circle of influence that lies within our circle of concern. In other words, we must work on the things that we can do something about, the things we can influence. The positive energy we exert will cause our circle of influence to expand. Reactive people, on the other hand, will focus on things that are in their circle of concern, but not in their circle of influence, which leads to blaming external factors, emanating negative energy and causing their circle of influence to shrink. Hey, are you liking this video? Then please consider to leave a like or a comment. It really does help grow the channel and it will make it so that I can make even better videos for you guys. Thank you. Now the key lessons from this habit is to challenge yourself to test the principle of proactivity by doing the following. Challenge number one is to start replacing reactive language with proactive language. Example, a reactive person would say, this person makes me so mad. A proactive person, however, still gets the same impulses and might get a little mad in the beginning, but ultimately they will catch themselves and they will say, I control my own feelings and they will just shut it out. The second challenge is to convert reactive tasks into proactive ones. Reactive people would say something like this. Once I get too fat, I'll start running again. Proactive people, however, would say I'm trying to keep my body and mind optimized at all times by eating well and doing cardio and weightlifting on the predetermined days every week. They don't have to keep re-engaging themselves and fight the same battle over and over and therefore are much more effective people. So this is habit number one out of seven. Be proactive. Are you by nature a proactive or reactive person? Comment down below to let me know. It's incredibly easy to get caught up in an activity trap, in the busyness of life to work harder and harder at climbing the ladder of success only to discover it's leaning against the wrong wall. Habit 2 suggests that in everything we do we should begin with the end in mind. That way we can make sure that the steps we are taking are in the right direction. But before we as individuals or organizations can start setting and achieving goals, we must be able to identify our values. This process may involve some re-scripting. And re-scripting, Covey explains, is recognizing ineffective scripts that have been written for you and changing those scripts by proactively writing new ones that are built on your own values. At the same time, it's also important to identify our center. For instance, you might be family-centered. When your security is founded on family acceptance and fulfilling family expectations. Or you might be more money-centered when your personal worth is determined by your net worth. You could even be pleasure-centered when you make decisions based on what will give you the most pleasure. Our centers affect us fundamentally. They determine our daily decisions, actions and motivations, as well as our interpretation of events. However, Covey notes that none of these centers are optimal and that instead we should strive to be principle-centered. This is timeless and will give us the guidance that we need to align our behaviors with our beliefs and values. Now to put habit two into practice, here's two challenges that you should do. 
Challenge number one, visualize your own funeral in rich detail. Who is there and what are they saying about you, about how you lived your life and what would you want them to say? This might be a powerful tool for some perspective. And you might find out that some of these answers will give you different values that you already have. Challenge number two, break down different roles in your life. Whether professional, personal or community, list three goals what you want to achieve for each. It's simple but effective. By doing this you will reaffirm what your main focus should be and you might find out that some of the things you are doing now aren't exactly helping towards one of these goals. In order to manage ourselves effectively, we must put first things first, but we must have the discipline to do the most important things first, not the most urgent things as so many people do. In habit two, we discussed how important it is to understand our values and to begin with the end in mind. Habit three is about going after these predetermined goals in an effective way. Covey starts out by saying that in order to stay on track toward our goals, we need to have the willpower to do something when we don't want to do it. Where a lot of people go wrong is that they act with their emotions and impulses instead of their values. It's captured all too well by this quote of Stephen Covey. The challenge is not to manage time, but to manage ourselves. I'm sure you've had moments where you don't really want to go to the gym even though you plan to do it. In these moments it's especially important to do it. You will build up a tolerance to your own bullshit and your own lies. Sometimes we react to urgent matters that in reality are not all that important. Think of sending back a quick text message to a friend while you're in the middle of reading a book to learn something new and now you've lost your train of thought. It may seem like the right thing to do because it may be urgent, but if we do this too much, the important stuff never gets done. Covey developed a simple framework for the types of problems we encounter in our life, and this is that framework. When we focus on something in quadrant one, we spend our time managing crises and problems. These are important and urgent matters. Having too much of this can lead to stress. Matters of little importance are shown in quadrant three. They can still be urgent or at least have the illusion of urgency. These activities can take the form of random interruptions, calls, meetings or popular activities. And focusing too much on this leads to a short term focus and a lack of control. The activities in quadrant four are neither important nor urgent. Think of them as time wasters like complaining, gossiping or commuting during rush hour. Too many activities like these and it can lead to being highly dependent on others and feeling a lack of purpose. I've saved quadrant two for last since these are the most overlooked activities. The activities in this quadrant are important but not so urgent to many people. Activities such as relationship building, meditation, planning or health related activities. This quadrant is at the very heart of effective personal management. It's things that we know we need to do but somehow seldom get around to doing because they don't feel urgent from moment to moment. When we focus on quadrant two, it means that we are thinking ahead, working on our roots and preventing crises from happening in the first place. So how can we focus on more activities from this quadrant? The key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. Now this wouldn't be a lifelong learner episode if we didn't give you some practical advice. Create your own framework as we discussed earlier. Put your daily, weekly, monthly activities and habits in a framework like this one and divide them amongst the quadrants. Now pay extra attention to quadrant two and make a deal with yourself that this always comes first. If you want to go one step further, estimate how much time you spend on average per day on each quadrant. Then roughly log the activities over three days or a week. Then take the average per day and see how accurate your estimate is. How much time did you spend in quadrant two and did you neglect it? And now because of this framework, you can see exactly where you need to spend less time. So put first things first, not the urgent matters, but the important ones. To establish effective interdependent relationships, we must commit to creating win-win situations that are mutually beneficial to each party. One time Stephen was asked to work with a company whose president was very concerned about the lack of cooperation amongst his people. Once a week this man would bring in all the people into his office and talk cooperation. He said let's all work together, we'll make more money if we do. But then he would pull the curtain and show them a chart. Which one of you is going to win the trip to Bermuda? He wanted cooperation, he wanted his people to work together, but at the same time he was setting them up in competition with each other. 
Covey explains that there are six paradigms of human interaction. Win-win. Win-win is a frame of mind that constantly seeks mutual benefit in all human interactions. Win-win means that agreements or solutions are mutually beneficial and mutually satisfying. Win-win is a belief in the third alternative. It's not your way, it's not my way, it's a better way. One alternative to win-win is win-lose, the paradigm of the race to Bermuda as discussed earlier. In leadership style, win-lose is the authoritarian approach, I get my way and you don't get yours. I had to use win-lose on that, it was not pretty. The academic world reinforces win-lose scripting. The normal distribution curve basically says that you got an A because someone else got a C. It interprets an individual's value by comparing him or her to everyone else. But some people are also programmed the other way, lose-win. Step on me again, everyone does. I'm a loser, I've always been a loser. I'm a peacemaker, I'll do anything to keep the peace. Lose-win is even worse than win-lose because it has no standards, no demands, no expectation and no vision. People who think lose-win are usually quick to please or appease. They seek strength from popularity or acceptance. They have little courage to express their own feelings and convictions and are easily intimidated by others. Now the worst way is definitely lose-lose. No one is happy. I know of a divorce in which the husband was directed by the judge to sell all of his assets and turn half of the proceeds to his ex-wife. Now in compliance he sold his car that's worth over $10,000 for $50 and gave $25 to the wife. He didn't mind losing as long as his ex-wife was losing. Lose-lose is also the philosophy of a highly dependent person without inner direction who is miserable and think everyone else should be too. If nobody wins, perhaps being a loser isn't so bad. Another common alternative is simply to think win. People with the win mentality don't necessarily want someone else to lose. That's irrelevant to them. What matters is that they get what they want. This doesn't really work well though when teamwork is required. And the sixth one is win-win or no deal. Win-win, no deal basically means that if we can't find a solution that benefits us both, we agree to disagree agreeably. No deal. It basically says, I want to win and I want you to win. And I don't just want to get my way and have you not feel good about it. Because later it might surface and lead to complications. Now which of these six is what to strive for? With win-lose or lose-win, one person appears to get what he wants for the moment, but the results will negatively impact the relationship between those people going forward. If you go for win-win situations, people will want to work with you more because they know you also empathize with their goals. The win-win or no deal option is important to use as a backup. When we have a no deal as an option in our mind, it liberates us from needing to manipulate people and to push our own agenda. We can simply say no deal and go our separate ways, maybe next time. So get yourself to start thinking win-win. Let me know in the comments what your tendencies in interactions are. Are they win-lose and how does it affect your interactions? Then determine whether or not this approach serves you well in the long run. According to Stephen Covey, communication is the most important skill in life. We spend most of our waking hours communicating, but consider this. You've spent years learning how to read, write and speak, but chances are you've never truly learned how to listen. If you want to interact effectively with someone or to influence someone like your spouse, your boss or your friend, you first need to understand that person. Alright, so suppose you have been having trouble with your eyes and you decide to go to an optometrist for help. After briefly listening to your complaint, he takes his glasses off and hands them to you. He says, put these on, I've worn this pair of glasses for 10 years now and they've really helped me out. And you say, no, this is terrible, I can't see a thing. And he asks, well, what's wrong? They work great for me, try harder. And you say, I am trying, you insist, everything is a blur. And he says, boy, you're ungrateful. And this is what often happens in communication. People use their own perspective for someone else's solution. And this is called autobiographical listening. Most people listen with the intent to reply and not to understand. There's no doubt you experience this every week if not every day, I know I do. People are saying things to each other in a way that they aren't trying to get to a solution together or are they trying to like achieve something with this conversation, but they are only telling each other their own perspectives and their own experiences. And what good does that do? When we listen autobiographically, so in other words with our own perspective as our frame of reference, we tend to respond in four different ways. 
One is evaluate, you agree or disagree with what is said. Two is probe, you ask questions but from your frame of reference. Three is advice, you give counsel based on your own experience. And four is interpret, trying to figure out the person's motive and behavior based on your own motives and behavior. Now we need to shift our minds away from autobiographical listening towards empathic listening. To listen empathically requires a fundamental paradigm shift. To listen with empathy is the ability to project oneself into the personality of another person in order to better understand that person's emotions or feelings. And there are numerous benefits to empathic listening. One, it increases the speaker's confidence and you gain the speaker's cooperation, it reduces stress and tension, it builds teamwork, you gain trust and you will be able to gain an unobstructed flow of thoughts and knowledge from and about the speaker. So you might think, well, that's all well and good, but how do we listen empathically instead of autobiographical? Firstly, we need to have the willingness to have the other person dominate the conversation. Now, there's a number of caveats that you need to be aware of. You need to not interrupt. And this drives me crazy. When someone interrupts me, I just shut up. I just go back to work or whatever I was doing because interrupting is probably the rudest thing you can do to a person. You're basically saying, hang on a second, because my thing is more important. The second thing is don't change the subject or move in a new direction. You need to act like a mirror until they feel confident enough that you know enough so that they can ask for your opinion. So don't push, be patient, be respectful and just let them talk. The longer you let someone talk, the more clearly you can understand their position. So when we're able to present our ideas clearly and in the context of deep understanding of the other person's needs and concerns, we significantly increase the credibility of our ideas. So seek first to understand and then to be understood. The essence of synergy is valuing the differences of the mental, emotional and psychological differences between people. By applying synergy, we value the differences in other people as a way to expand our own perspective, to sidestep negative energy and to look for the good in others. Today we continue with habit number 6 of Stephen Covey's book, The 7 Habits of Highly Effective People. What exactly is synergy? Simply defined, it means that the whole is greater than the sum of its part. When properly understood, synergy is the highest activity in all life, the true test and manifestation of all other habits put together. Synergy is everywhere in nature. If you plant two trees close together, the roots commingle and improve the quality of the soil. Both plants will benefit as a result of that. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So how can we introduce synergy to a given situation or environment? Start with habits number 4 and 5, you must think win-win and seek to understand. I covered these in my last two videos. Once you have these in mind, you can pool your desires with those of the other person or the group. And then you're not on opposite sides of the problem, you're working together on one side, looking at the problem, understanding all the needs and working to create a third alternative that will meet them. What we end up with is not a transaction, but a transformation. Both sides will get what they want and they will build their relationship in the process. Valuing differences in people is the essence of synergy. The key to valuing differences is to realize that all people see the world differently, not as it is, but as they are. In other words, the world is a reflection of their own disposition. If I think I see the world as it is, why would I want to value the differences? Why would I even bother with someone who's off track? My paradigm is that I am objective. I see the world as it is. Everyone else is wrong and tainted, but I see the larger picture. Now, if that's the way I think, I will never be effectively interdependent or even effectively independent for that matter. For someone with a large ego, this might be very hard to understand or to accept. Now, is it logical that people can disagree and both be right? It's not logical, but it is psychological and it's very real. You can see a young lady and I can see an old woman and we're both looking at the same picture and both of us can be right. We see the same black lines, we see the same white spaces, but we interpret them differently because we've been conditioned to interpret them differently. All I see is an old woman, but I realize that you see something else. You need to value that perception and you need to want to understand. So when you become aware of the difference in perceptions, you need to say, good, you see it differently. Help me see what you see. 
By doing this, you will not only increase your own awareness, you will also affirm the other person. It gives the other person psychological air. You take the foot off the brake and make room for the third alternative. You create the environment for synergy. So habit six, synergy, value the differences. It largely builds upon habits four and five. When we seek to first understand and when we're looking for a win-win situation, we create an environment for synergy. So the next time you have a disagreement or a confrontation with someone, attempt to understand the concerns of that person's position. Address those concerns in a creative and a mutually beneficial way. You will both be so much better off for it. Suppose you were to come upon someone in the woods working feverishly to saw down a tree. And you ask, what are you doing? And he says, can't you see? I'm sawing down this tree. You look exhausted, you say. How long have you been doing this? He says, over five hours, boy, and I am beat. And then you go, why don't you take some time to sharpen the saw? I'm pretty sure it will go a lot faster. And he goes, I don't have time to sharpen the saw. I'm too busy sawing. To be effective in the everyday life, we must devote time to renewing ourselves physically, spiritually, mentally, and socially. Habit 7 is about preserving and enhancing the greatest assets you have, you. And we do this by renewing the four dimensions of your nature, physical, spiritual, mental, and social emotional. The physical dimension. The physical dimension involves caring effectively for our physical body, eating the right kinds of foods, getting sufficient rest and exercising on a regular basis. Most of us think that we don't have enough time for these things, but really we don't have time not to. We're talking about three to six hours a week of combined strength and cardio exercise. That hardly seems like a large amount of time considering the tremendous benefits on the other 160 hours of the week. Not only will you increase your strength and your health, but you will also increase your self-confidence and your integrity so that later that night you can rest on your head with ease, knowing that you were productive that day. The spiritual dimension. The spiritual dimension is your core, your commitment to your value system. It draws upon the sources that inspire you and uplift you, and every person does it differently. I, for instance, find renewal in the strength through listening to audiobooks or by listening to remarkable people talk, such as Jocko Willink. I listen to one of his videos every day before my workout just to get myself in the right headspace so that I can get the most out of my day. Again, every person does it differently. Some people meditate and some people do yoga or some people even just retreat into nature. The idea is when we take time to refocus on the center of our lives, it renews us, it refreshes us and we recommit to our value system. So think about something you're passionate about, something you identify with and what centers you and practice this daily. The mental dimension. Most of our mental development comes through formal education, but as soon as we leave school, many of us let our minds atrophy. Many don't do any more serious reading, we don't think analytically about anything anymore, and we don't explore new subjects to any real depth. There is no better way to inform and expand your mind than to get into the habit of reading good literature. You can get into the best minds that are now or have ever been in the world, and that is simply amazing to me. I highly recommend starting with a book a month and then a book every two weeks and then a book a week if you have time to do so. After all, the person who doesn't read is no better off than the person who can't read. I personally like to listen to audiobooks, I find it more efficient. If you want to try it out for free with a 30 day trial and two free audiobooks on Audible, check out my affiliate link in the description. The social and emotional dimension. Success in habits four, five, and six are highly related to our sense of personal security. But where does personal security come from? It comes from living a life of integrity in which our daily habits reflect our deepest values. One potential important source can be your work, but another source can be anonymous service. It is different for each person, so find out whatever social services reflect your values and strive to do this as much as possible. Maybe it's teaching, maybe it's working with a specific community, or maybe it's just having meaningful conversations with your friends. So sharpen the saw, to me easily the most important habit of this book. Strive to make daily or weekly progression along all of these dimensions and I can promise you, you will be more effective.
I hope you enjoyed this video. Animation videos like these take me such a long time to create, so please consider leaving a like or a comment. When you subscribe to my channel, you will receive the most valuable ideas that I read out of books from trusted authors right on your subscription page every week. Oh, and if you don't want to miss a video, don't forget to click on that bell. These videos are meant as an overview and as an introduction to the topic, so if you want to learn more things and really get into the details, go to Audible using my link in the description for two free audio books with a free trial in the description you will also find my recommended books and the best material investments i have bought over the years thank you for watching and see you next week